week, but I'm going to uh, shorten it up and get ready for our prayer line. Bless the preaching of your word, Lord. The Holy Spirit is here, and he is the spirit of truth. Empower us to minister the good word of God and confirm your word with signs and wonders following. Your name be praised. You alone be glorified in Jesus' name. And amen. I'm on fire here. But that's good. Take me down a little bit. I'm popping. Maybe it's my hearing aid. Or it's you. So let's take it down a little bit. Everybody stretch for a second. Let's take it down a little bit. Let's fix this thing before I get started. Everybody stretch. Oh, some of you haven't had your Wheaties. Yes, testing one, two. Testing one, two. Give me a little bit on the platform, please. I don't. I was good a minute ago. I don't know what we changed because I liked it a minute ago. So give me a little more on the platform, a little less out there. You guys are amazing. I wouldn't want your job for a million dollars. Maybe a million and a half, but not a million. Thank you. You're so faithful, guys. You're a great team. I love you. Thank you for working with me. Preachers are funny about the sound. It's an obsessive thing. We need to do Vox. We really do. HDD. What time is it? There's, there's a surprising little nugget of a verse buried in the soil of the Old Testament scripture. I, I don't know if you've ever stumbled across this treasure. I don't know if you, you've ever noticed this little diamond flashing as you surveyed some very raw material in First Chronicles. I, I'm thinking of First Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 32. This is a reference to the sons of Isaacar. Have you ever heard a sermon on the sons of Isaacar? Well, I tell you, this statement about the sons of Isaacar, this is a treasure. Here it is. The sons of Isaacar had understanding of the time to know what Israel ought to do. Is that a treasure? The sons of Isaacar. How were they labeled? How were they distinguished? What was outstanding about them? They had understanding of the time to know what Israel ought to do. That's the goal of this sermon right now, that we will be like the sons of Isaacar, to develop a discernment of the time in which we live so that we will know what we ought to do. This is the question Paul is raising in Romans 13. Do you know what time it is? Now, I'm very conscious of time. I'm very conscious of time because I'm always in a hurry. I would rather be one hour early than five minutes late. That's just me. So I'm always thinking about time. Now, my issue is I'm married to a dear lady who's never in a hurry. E-harmony would have never put us together. Now, that's hard to be married to a woman who's never in a hurry when you're racing on the inside. I'm just racing on the inside. I was sitting at the uh, red light here where the Wawa is, Wawa, and I was to make a left, but it just turned red when I got up to it, and I thought, I'm going to sit here four minutes. I ain't sitting here four minutes. I'd rather be moving than sitting, so I took a right, went way down 228, took a U-turn. And, and didn't get back to the intersection before I would have normally gone through the intersection, but I, it was more fun moving than just sitting there. No, I just race on the inside. That's me. Tara's always just slow down, smell the coffee. I told her the other day, 
It was Sunday night. We're getting ready to watch 60 Minutes. I said, Tara, it's going to take you 70 minutes to watch 60 Minutes. <laughs> and then I came up with something really good Saturday. I said, Tara, I just can't believe. I can't believe that out of 100,000 sperm, you were the fastest. <laughs> well, Tara's been good for me to sit at the red light, slow down, smell the coffee. We need, we need opposites, don't we? Don't go through e-harmony. Let God put somebody in your life that will really challenge you. But I'm time conscious. I'm time conscious. And, and I, I collect watches from all over the world. Wherever I go, I pick up a watch. I picked up two watches in India. And for Christmas, Tara bought me a beautiful wooden box with a glass top so I could display my watches. My favorite piece of furniture in my house is my grandfather clock. And so I have a great love for time pieces. But you know, you can collect clocks and watches and always be on time and punctual and still miss out on knowing the real time. Do we know the time in which we live? Are we discerning of that? Do we know God's clock and God's calendar? By the way, just as a little footnote here, for the summer months, June and July, for those two months, for seven Sundays, I'm going to preach on facets of the future. And we're going to be dealing with some crucial issues concerning God's plan for planet Earth and humanity. Some deep, insightful truths that I want you to pray about and tell people about. Is America in Bible prophecy, for example? Will humanity destroy itself? So many things that I want to talk to you about in the summer. So go on vacation, but get back. But do we know the time? I want us to have a discernment about the time. Not just so we can debate about it and, and be smart and impress people with a little bit of knowledge about eschatology. Use that big word, eschatology. The doctrine of future things. No, but we want to have discernment of the time so we can take action, appropriate action. The sons of Issachar, they knew, they had an understanding of the time so that they knew what Israel ought to do. In verse 11, Paul says, This do, knowing the time. Folks, this message is going to be a big failure if we just go home and, and sit around uh, Texas ribs and discuss prophecy. We need to take action. Paul says, this do, knowing the time. You see, Paul is here in the practical, ethical instructions of the book of Romans, but he doesn't want us to listen to this and yawn in the face of God. He doesn't want us to just kind of turn over and, and hit the snooze button and go, this doesn't really have relevance to my life. All of this practical teaching about everyday Christianity. And so he gives us a sense of urgency here. He frames this teaching in eschatological urgency. He takes it up to another level. And he says, we really need to pay attention to these exhortations and commandments, knowing the time. This do, knowing the time. Well, there's a couple of things, and then I'm going to be done. What time is it? Number one, it's time to pay up. It's time to pay up. I'm looking at verse 8. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves one another has fulfilled the law. Now, what does that mean? That's kind of scary. How do we interpret that? No... Oh, no man anything. 
Ouch. Does that mean we can't undertake some debts? Does that mean we can't go to the bank and borrow money? Does that mean we can't purchase a home until we can pay for it in cash? Does that mean we can't have any credit cards? Not to owe any man anything. Well, obviously, we have to balance Scripture with Scripture. And the Bible as a whole certainly supports the concept of borrowing capital for the purpose of investment. In fact, there's actually guidelines about borrowing money from other people or from institutions. And so we have biblical permission to borrow money. But this verse does mandate us to pay our debts on time, and to not have outstanding debts. See, as of today, April 28th, I don't owe the bank anything for my car payments. But come the 15th of May, if I don't send in a check and a payment, I will owe them money. So in other words, we're simply to pay our debts faithfully, That's a clear teaching, to have integrity with our indebtedness as Christians. But then Paul goes a step further, and he says, you know what? Pay your debts. Have a good reputation as a Christian. Satisfy your debts. Be on time. Don't take on too much burden that you can't discharge those debts. We need to be careful about those things, don't we? But... Paul says there's one debt that you can never pay off, and that is the debt to love people. Now, you know, you may be a great money manager. Tara manages all my money. I don't even see my paycheck. It goes into a direct deposit. It's just gone. And I get a little little, little uh, allowance if I'm nice. Well, you... you you may have, she has greater ability than me. You may have greater ability to manage money and budget and reduce debt. Get out of debt. Tara and I are trying to do that. Get out of debt. You may be disciplined and thrifty and, and, and handle your personal finances, but I will tell you this. There's one debt that will always remain outstanding. That is your duty to love. You can never stop loving a person and say, I love that person enough. I'm done. I did my duty. I'm done. You can't do that. Now, Jesus said, how often shall I forgive my brother who sins against me? Seven times? The ultimate number. Seven? And Jesus said, Peter, let's talk about this. If someone offends you seven times and you forgive seven times and now you think you're a super-duper whooper whopper because you've forgiven seven times someone who's hurt your feelings. That's fine, Peter. I applaud you. But you haven't even begun to cancel the debt of love to that person. You're not done with that person. You still have a debt that you owe. So how about seven times 70? After you've forgiven seven times, you still haven't canceled that debt of love. You're still obligated to love. See, love is not only a duty and a debt, but it's a delight because it brings deep fulfillment to human psyche and human personality because love fulfills the law. Now notice... Notice, love is not the end of the law. It is the fulfillment of the law. Some people think that love replaces the law so that, you know, just as long as you do it in love, it's okay. Hey, a lot of destructive behavior is going on in the name of love. But when you love somebody, you actually act toward that person in harmony with God's law. Because the standard of God's law is what honors and protects the human individual. What is sin? Well, Paul said it's the transgression of the law. And here, in Romans 13, Paul says that sin is what harms people and dehumanizes people. 
Think about it. Think of the, the commandments Paul refers to here in Romans 13. Murder takes away life. Adultery takes away home and honor. Theft takes away property. False witness takes away a good name. Covetousness takes away quiet and contentment. Do you see how sin hurts people? And so when you love somebody, you treat that person right. When you love a man, you don't sleep with his wife. When you love a man, you don't kill him. When you love a man, you don't stab him in the back with your words. When you love a man, you don't steal his stuff. When you love a man, you don't begrudge his success. So what? Love fulfills the law. And so Augustine famously said, one of my favorite quotes of church history, here he said it 1,700 years ago, but it's still celebrated today. Augustine said, if you want one word of advice on the ethical life, here it is, love God and love people, and then do what you want. But that's the point. Love is not the end of the law, it's the fulfillment of the law. Love needs law for direction. Law needs love for inspiration. And Jesus tells us that as time marches on, iniquity will abound, and what happens? The love of many will wax cold. That's the day we're living in. What time is it? Iniquity is abounding, and the love of many waxing cold. And so what time is it? Paul says, pay up. You have a debt. You have a duty. Love people. And love fulfills the law. Pay up. Secondly, Paul says, what time it is? Is it? He says, wake up. Wake up. No, I mean it. Wake up. Some of you over there, wake up. Verse, verse 11. And do this, knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of our sleep. I heard about an elderly man who brought his um, grandson to church every Sunday morning. They together sat on the front pew, but granddad would fall asleep halfway into the sermon. And then, you know, that wasn't so bad, but he would indulge into loud snoring. Just disturb the whole thing. And so... The pastor was pretty smart and met the, the little boy after church one day and said, listen, I'll give you five bucks every Sunday morning if you can keep granddad awake. Hey, okay. That went well for a while. And, and finally, uh, there was one Sunday morning where granddad went to sleep and snoring real loud. And the pastor said to the little boy after church, he said, uh, what happened? We had a deal, five bucks. Yeah, but granddad said if I keep him awake, if I leave them alone, I'll give them, I'll give you ten dollars. It's a better deal. Well, some people are sleeping in the sanctuary, but too many sermons are like bedtime stories. The pulpit needs to sound the alarm. Oh, Pastor, don't don't get all frothy this morning. The pulpit needs to sound the alarm. It was April 18, 1775, when the British brought their troops to Boston. And they had a plan. At night, while people slept, they were going to bring their troops across little boats and attack Concord and Lexington. And it was going to be a disaster while they slept. But there was one man who was awake. And Paul Revere, he got on his horse and he galloped from village to village and house to house, crying, the British are coming, the British are coming. And I tell you, he stirred people's spirit. And candles were lit and windows were open. And men got out of bed and got their muskets and put on their uniforms. They were called minute men. They were ready in a minute. And they went out in the streets to defend their land and to meet the enemy. I want to tell you that the enemy is upon us. Satan is launching a plan even now. Let's not be dull toward the reality of spiritual warfare. The enemy is upon us. 
And Satan is cunning. And he wants to cripple this church. He wants to kidnap our children. He wants to poison our influence. He wants to paralyze our worship. He wants to destroy our souls. And beloved, we need to shake ourselves out of this sleep of death and rise to the occasion of spiritual warfare. Samson fell asleep in the lap of Delilah and got the most expensive haircut in human history. And she skillfully cut away his power with God so that he became like other men. The parable says that while farmers slept, The enemy came and sowed bad seed in the garden. Eutychus slept while Paul preached and he fell out of the window and broke his neck. Peter, James, and John slept during the hour of prayer. Jesus said, could you not watch one hour? One hour of prayer. Could you not watch one hour and share with me in my agony? But they slept during the hour of prayer. And when the enemy came to the gate of the garden, they did not have the power to resist temptation. The book of Proverbs says that a son who sleeps during the harvest season is a son who causes shame. I tell you that this is a high time. These are days of great opportunity. And these are days of great challenge. And and we give advantage to the enemy. And we lose blessings if we are asleep. What time is it? Oh, it's time to wake up. Anybody here in the Word of the Lord today? It's time to wake up. That's why I'm screaming. Time to wake up. Number three, it's time to look up. Time to look up. This do knowing the time. It's high time to wake out of our sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Our salvation is near, says Paul. Hey, our salvation is near. You may say, well, Pastor, I thought I was already saved. I thought I was already in the state of salvation. Isn't that what Romans has been, you've been preaching since September? Yes, we are in a state of salvation. But the full measure of our salvation has not yet been experienced. Isn't it nice to know that the best is yet to come? I know you're enjoying your salvation right now. I know you go in the backyard on the spring day and sing, and he walks with me and he talks with me. I know you're enjoying your salvation. I enjoy it. I'm not enduring it. I'm enjoying it. I like being saved. But, beloved, the full measure of salvation is still in the future. The full experience of it is in the future. And so Paul says that that there's a future aspect to our salvation, a full deliverance when the Lord Jesus returns. And he says that our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. I don't know when it was you got saved, but now that you're down the road of the journey of faith, you're closer to home and you're closer to the coming of Christ. Paul is talking about the shortness of time and the lateness of the hour. You may say, well, if that was the last days, how can this be the last days? If that was 2,000 years ago, he wrote that. That's a good question. But you see, the phrase the last days is a technical theological term. The last days started at the ascension of Christ. The ascension and enthronement of Christ. That started what's called the last days. Because when Jesus went back to the Father, He started preparing a place for you and me. And He said, I will come again and receive you unto Myself, that where I am there ye may be also. And so the next event on God's calendar is the coming of Christ. There is no other thing to take place except the coming of Christ. That's the next event. And we don't know when that's going to happen. And so we're living in the last days. And that's why every generation of Christians, every generation of Christians have been commanded 
to watch and to have hope and to have vigilance. In fact, it's interesting that the Apostle Paul, he never taught that Christ would uh, come in the first century. He never emphatically said that's what's going to happen. But yet Paul had that hope and expectation, taught the church to have it, even in the first century. And even Paul, watch this, he used language to express that blessed hope. So that when he described the rapture, what did he say? Look how he worded the rapture. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Do you see what Paul is doing? He's putting himself in the company of the living at the coming of Christ. Paul's not saying, you know, I know I'm going to be dead and in the graveyard, but when he comes, I'm going to get up, and then those that are alive are going to be caught up. That's not what he said. He said, those who are dead in Christ will rise first. That's because they're six down, six feet down further. It takes longer to get up. But the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we, we, he said, I, I, I expect to be alive when he comes. What was Paul doing? He wasn't setting a doctrine that Christ will come in the first century. He was simply expressing obedience to Christ that every generation of believers live on tiptoes of expectation and keep your eye focused on the eastern horizon and keep your ears open to the sound of the trumpet. Tara and I went to the Kennedy Center the other Saturday night to hear uh, Bro, uh, Boki, Chris Bodie, the best trumpeter in the world. Is that Bodie or Bodie? I don't know what it is, but he sure knows how to blow a horn. Best trumpeter in the world. We were in the front row, and I mean for two hours we are bawling and squalling, listening to this man play the trumpet with the National Symphony Orchestra accompanying him. But I was sitting there thinking, yeah, Chris, you think you can play the trumpet? And I paid a lot of money to hear this, but, but there's someone who can play the trumpet better than you. One day, there's going to be the trump of God. And it's going to be so great. It's going to wake the dead. And it's going to translate God's church. And we will see him face to face. Clap your hands and praise the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Are you listening for the call? Are you listening for the sound? Every day, get up and say, I wonder if this is the day that he'll come back for his beloved. Oh, we're to live with that joy. Look up. What time is it? Look up. Woo. Number four, what time is it? I know you're saying it's time to shut the sermon down. No. Two more points. Two more points. Two more points. What time is it? Oh, I know you don't want to hear this one. It's time to clean up. Clean up. Verses 12 and 13. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly. Be appropriate. Be proper. As in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. Oh, Paul gets too specific here. Paul is not lost in abstract ideas here. He gets specific. What do we need to clean up? He says six things. He says, put aside revelry. That means wild parties. Have a party, but keep it tame. And then drunkenness. Now, Hebrew and Greek cultures, they embraced wine drinking. Neither of those cultures were teetotalers. They had a breakfast called a Akratisma, where even the children drank wine, and they would take a, a piece of bread and dip it in wine. Wine was always considered a gift from God from the Greeks and the Hebrews, but drunkenness was always a disgraceful thing. Paul says, put away immorality. Literally, that word means the forbidden bed. 
Paul says, put away shamelessness. That's an ugly word. Describes a person who has no longer the ability to blush. He indulges in wickedness and doesn't care who sees him. And then there's the word contention. Literally, it means unholy competition. Now, I like competition because I like sports. Competition can be healthy, enjoyable, constructive, entertaining. But there is an unholy competition where a person can be so consumed with power, prestige, and place that that personal ambition is destructive. And then envy. That's the spirit which cannot be content and thankful, but it looks with a jealous eye on those that have blessings that they wish they had. Paul is very specific here. He turns the light on. When he turns the light on, the dirt is exposed. And he says, clean up. Now that you're saved, put away these works of darkness. Jesus is coming. Get your house in order. Now I want to tell you, when I, when I meditate on these verses in prayer throughout the whole week, I kind of feel like Isaiah, and I want to have his response. For Isaiah was in the temple, and the lights turned on because the glory of the Lord was shining. He saw the Lord high and lifted up. He heard the angels sing, Holy, holy, holy. The train of God's robe filled the temple. And then what did Isaiah do in the light of the presence of God and the proclamation of holiness? Isaiah said, Woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And what happened? The angel went to the altar, took a live coal, swept down and placed it on the prophet's lips and said, Behold, your sin is purged and your iniquity is taken away. I just pray that in this temple this morning as the holiness of God is proclaimed in this passage and the light is turned on, that somehow we'll just have a humility and an honesty and we'll say, woe is me. Oh God, I'm undone. Woe is me. And beloved, an angel will come with coals from off the altar of heaven and cleanse us and sanctify us and change us and purge us. Don't you want that today? To be cleansed by God Almighty. Only God can make you holy. Only God can make you holy. And how we need to be broken in His holy presence. Say, Lord, I'm undone. I'm undone. We need to clean up. And then finally, in closing, we need to dress up. We need to dress up. That's what time it is. Because verse 14 says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Every day appropriate Jesus Christ. Now, you know what's so beautiful about that is the positive aspect here. We put off to put on. I know some of you just think Christianity is one negative after the other. But really, the only reason we say no to the devil is that we can turn around and say yes to all the blessings of God. And the only reason we deny self is we can, so we can delight in the Savior. And the only reason we resist evil is that we can turn around and then receive all the abundance of God. And so Paul says... Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Don't you love the full title there? The Lord Jesus Christ. When you put on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're putting on direction and authority because He's the Lord. You're putting on the Lord. Some of you are miserable because you have no purpose for life. You have no sense of direction, no vision. I'm so excited about my meeting tomorrow night because I have vision. I have ideas. I have something God's been showing me. Can't wait to tell you some stuff. And, and we can live that way with purpose in our lives and authority in that purpose because we put on the Lord. But you put on Jesus, the Lord Jesus. That means you put on deliverance. 
Because Jesus is Savior. Jesus is Joshua. Joshua was, was the commander-in-chief of the armies of God. And, and Joshua led them out of the wilderness and brought them into the promised land. And there was victory after victory. You put on Jesus. You're putting on deliverance. You're putting on emancipation from the wilderness. You're putting on the promised land. You're putting on the salvation, the beauty of the garments of salvation. And then you put on Jesus Christ. You put on Christ. That means you put on dynamite. Because Christ means anointing. It means power from on high. It means supernatural strength. It means the anointing breaks the yoke. I want to tell you, when you put on Christ, you're putting on the Spirit of Christ. And you can say with Paul, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Every day you're sufficient. Every day you're more than enough because you put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. In closing, I have a friend who, an acquaintance named Paul Walker. He's retired now, but he pastored that great church in Atlanta, Georgia, Mount Perrin. And he's in his office one day, and a lady comes in and says, Pastor, do you know you have angels in your church? He said, Well, I know we have some devils in the church. Uh, tell me about the angels. She says, well, I had a stroke a couple months ago and I was totally paralyzed and rushed to the hospital. And my throat was paralyzed where I couldn't swallow and so the doctor said I was going to die. One of your members, spirit-filled Christian believer, came and prayed for me and God healed my throat. And I was able to swallow, so I was able to live, and I was just so happy. And then she taught me the ten-finger prayer so I could fully recover. She's an angel. Pastor, I want to tell you about the ten-finger prayer. It worked. It worked, Pastor. You see, the doctor said to me, okay, you can swallow, but but, but you you can't use your arm to feed yourself. But I used the ten-finger prayer. And my arms begin to work. Then the doctor said, all right, your arms can work, but you can't sit up. But I used the ten-finger prayer, and I begin to sit up. The doctor said, all right, you can sit up, but you'll never walk again. She said, Pastor, I used the ten-finger prayer, and I'm walking, and I'm in your church right now, 100% healed. He said, hallelujah. What's the ten-finger prayer? Pastor... Your Dr. Walker of Mount Perrin of 5,000 members, you know the Ten Finger Prayer? No. She goes, it goes like this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Woo! That's what it means to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no temptation too big. There's no worry too big. There's no problem too big. There's no boss too big. There's no financial set too big. There's no disease too big. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's come to the band. Let's come to the band. I want every instrument. I want the horn. I want the drum. I want the violin. I want the keyboard. Woo! I want I want the altar team right there to my right. And my ministers. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to pray for you. And then we're going to go home and eat some chicken. <laughs> now let me tell you what we're going to do. First of all, first of all, listen to me. Look at me. Look at me. If you need to be saved today, then you come in this line and accept Jesus Christ. I'm not going to tarry with any one individual. God told me what to do. I know exactly what to do. I'm going to simply put my hand on you with oil symbolizing the Spirit, and God is going to do something. Let me tell you what He's going to do. You ready? (laughs) He's going to give you a supernatural strength you've never had before. 
Now, with that strength, one of three things are going to happen. You either will adjust to your circumstances and be content, or you will overcome your circumstances, or God will use you to change it. But I don't know what the results will be, but God, in this simple prayer and contact with your pastor, God is going to give you a supernatural strength and impartation. I want us to sing some happy music, and we're going to have this moment of prayer together, and then we're going to come to the benediction. Uh, Roger, if you'll help me, we'll, we'll form the line over here, and I will stand here, lay hands on everybody, and then they'll come this way, and y'all can jump on them. You can have a little time with them if you want. If you want to have more lingering prayer, go to this little group and hang out. But God is going to, if you believe God's going to touch you right here, Amen. he told me he would. He told you, let's have faith. Let's have faith. Well, let's get a line going right here. Let's get some singing. Send it on down. Send it on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down. We pray, send it on down. Send it on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on. We pray, send it on down. Send it on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down. We need it. Send it on down. Send it on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on. Oh, send it on down. Send it on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down. Send it on down. We please send it on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down. Lord, we're your children, and we are asking for you to send the fire. Our hearts are hungry, our souls are thirsty. We want to feel your power, just like the prophets said it would be in the last day. Yes, we are waiting, anticipating, Lord, won't you send the Holy Ghost down? Send it on down, send it on down, Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down. Send it on down, send it on down, Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down. Heavenly Father, hear our call. 